welcome to How to Solve Problems with at, uh, Solve Problems at Expensify. My name is Joni. I'm on the marketing side of things. I'm also a director. Been at Expensify for about eight and a half years, and um, great to meet everyone. I'm sure, hopefully, I'll be able to talk to every single one of you. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm on the engineering team. I've been with Expensify for about four years. Uh, you might know me as Mark Aaron on GitHub or at Mark on Slack, not the other Mark, this Mark. Um, yeah, so um, I'm an engineer and that's me. I'm so excited for everyone to be here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for traveling all the way to get here. So we appreciate you and yeah. Okay, so uh, goals of this presentation. Um, this talk is really about like the how to solve problems but the Expensify way of solving problems. So it's really like a problem solving technique that we use. So our goals here are to collaborate better by understanding how Expensify identifies and solves problems. Uh, we are going to identify and prioritize the most impactful problems to solve and then get consensus by finally writing down the plan in a design doc and executing it. So here's the agenda overview, just so you know what's coming, you know, nothing too crazy, but we're gonna start off with problem solving as a best practice. We'll walk through the process and then we'll do a quick Q&A. So first, let's jump right into problem solving as a best practice. Why do we focus so much on problems at Expensify? I'm sure if you have been here for even a day or two or you know, six months, however long you've been with us, you always hear us say, what's the problem? What's the problem? Is that really a problem? Are you sure that's the problem? And the reason why we really, really focus on isolating and identifying the problem is because they are very open-ended, which means the problem that you are, you know, that you put forward might not be the actual problem that, um, you know, that is actually what's going on. It might just be, you know, the sub um, cause of, or a symptom of something larger. And it could also be a totally different problem than what we're experiencing. And so what we want to do when we focus on problems is avoiding subjectivity and bias, basically the most recent thing you experienced, right? Like sometimes we get a little bit emotional, sometimes a product doesn't behave in the way we want. And so we want people to take a little bit of an objectivity towards when they're um, proposing solutions, when we're thinking about what we're going to spend our time on and how we're going to um, build the product that we've all outlined and agreed with on our roadmap. And so the reason why we use what we call our problem solving process, right, the design doc process, is because we want to create a, uh, a consistent shared framework and shared language that all of us in this room, all of us at Expensify can use. And when we create that shared language, it means that all of a sudden we know exactly what we're referring to when we say the design doc process. We all know what we mean when we say, hey, did you do a pre-design, right? There's no ambiguity or inconsistency in this shared language once we all um, agree on the framework and use it in our processes to you know, build, um, build uh, software. And so the other reason is because it's very inclusive, it's transparent and asynchronous. And we designed it this way because as you know, everybody in this room is from all over the world, whether you're in San Francisco, I heard someone's from Turkmenistan, everyone's from all over the world. And so what that means is that we want, the, as David mentioned, you know, talent is everywhere. And so in order for us to have the best solutions and address um, the problems at scale, we want to make sure that we're including everyone who wants to participate to be able to. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of an idea of why Expensify is using this process, we can kind of dive into more of the nuts and bolts of what the process is. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, sorry. Which is, uh, the first one is gonna be to define the problem, then craft a proposal, and then get it done, so the results. And so for defining the problem, this is like the, the foundation. If your problem isn't good, then your solution is like worthless, so that's kind of how we see things. We don't really uh, start necessarily with ideas. Um, we usually think of like, we've got a problem, um, and it's, it's kind of hard to work from just a problem. Like you usually don't sit around and think like, oh, I've got a problem that needs to be solved. They don't just materialize out of nowhere. You're lucky if they do, but they don't always. So um, basically, it, we start with an idea, then 
we try to turn it into a problem and extract the problem from that idea. And then we validate the problem to figure out if it's actually a problem or not. And we have some common ways that we do this. So first idea is to have an idea. So the first thing that I want to just get across is that ideas are totally OK. When I first got to Expensify, I was like, Hey, I've got all these ideas. Um, I was a DJ and music producer before I came here. I did a lot of you know, collaboration with people. And what I got a lot from people was, what's the problem? What does it solve? And so I kind of wanted to share a dirty secret. That is, ideas are fine because you can use an idea to work backwards to find out what the underlying problem is. And then once you identify that problem, you'll have um, more opportunities to collaborate with people and have different solutions. So it's okay to have an idea, but you shouldn't go out and preach your idea into the streets right away. What you should do is talk to your colleagues, um, work with them privately, get a sense for like what um, is the, what are the potential problems that the idea touches and to basically become an expert in the domain area. So get, make yourself like very, very, well suited to speak on whatever the topic is in pursuit of trying to find this problem. And it's really important at this stage to avoid committing to a solution. You might have a solution in mind, but I would say don't lead with the solution necessarily in this research phase. Just kind of like get a sense for it. And this will help you discover what the problem might be once you have the problem. Um, you should try to extract it and try to get to the problem. So some methods for doing this are, first of all, you want to like strip it down and put it into the simplest terms possible so that you can explain to other people what this problem is. Because you need them to collaborate with you, and you need everyone to get on the same page. So stripping it down to the core issue, uh, one way that we do this is really think about who is experiencing the problem. So um, we maybe would say it's a customer, or it might be someone internally and think about what's, what's happening when they're using the product, um, what's, what, uh, how is it affecting them you know, in their day to day. Get as detailed as you can about really what the problem is. If you can go to the source, if you know the person and you can speak to them directly, that is like a very high quality source of a problem. And if you can ground it with examples, the more the better. And I would say if you can put them out into a list that helps you communicate this to someone else. Because I might say, hey, this is a problem. And you're like, cool, yeah, I think it's a problem. That just doesn't hit the same way that like a list of steps that lead to the endpoint that is a problem. So this is one just advice there. So you might have gotten to this point and realized that your problem sucks, or that you don't have a problem at all. If you're in that case and you're just stuck with your cool idea, you might want to consider to do nothing. So just, just do nothing. It's something that comes up a lot at Expensify. And it's kind of like an exit ramp. You're on the, the freeway, and it's like time, time to get off. And if you can, if you can do that, it's, it's a benefit, really. So it avoids us wasting time. We're solving problems that don't need to be solved. This is really core to Expensify. We just don't like doing this at all. We like to do things that are valuable. And we like to do, we like to do things that help people, too. So. Um, on the other hand, if you do have a solid problem, I'm here to tell you that it might not be as solid as you think it is. <laughs> and here are some things that will help you figure that out. So if your problem is a reverse problem solution, this is probably the most common thing that we see. Um, a good example on, that we use generally is at Expensify is um, we don't have the car. Let's get a car. And on the engineering side of things, it's like, we don't have automated testing. Let's build automated testing. Um, so this is like a classic problem solution that we, it's just been hard to find like a really good problem to put behind it. So sometimes you get these things that are a little bit tricky. Um, another thing is rumors versus problems. So you want to make sure that the problem that you're solving is not just somebody's opinion, but that it's based in fact. You, it might be a you problem, in other words. So you're experiencing it, but no one else sees it the same way. It feels really important to you. Um, and it might be, but 
that's something that where like more factual evidence can help you. So misunderstanding is the person holding it wrong. Like Steve Jobs famously said to people, you know, if we can solve it with like documentation, or can we train people to do things differently, have them understand that this is like, you know, they're holding it wrong. Um, then history and past teachings. Uh, what can we learn from the past? Have we solved this problem before? And do we need a new solution? Or is it a new problem? Or do we need to like fix our existing solution that we have? Like maybe there's something wrong with something that we've already done and looked at before. So uh, root problem or branch. Some of you are probably familiar with our like root cause analysis that we've implemented in the past to try to get back to like what actually caused something. So we really dislike hacking in general, although you might have found lots of hacks in the code. Uh -huh. So I'm not trying to like pretend that those aren't there. But so branches, we, we don't want to hack at the branches. We want to go for the root of the problem. And so if your problem points to a larger root problem, then you should try to see if that's the case and identify and, and lead back to that because ultimately you always want to solve something at its like lowest possible source. So last thing, you might have a really good solid problem, but you still have to sell people on the urgency and value of that problem. So we're kind of getting to this point where I feel like a lot of the problems that we have, most people are like, yeah, that's a problem and we've got a lot of people who can help us with this. So let's do it. But we still run into some cases where it's like, eh, we don't really need to do this, no one cares, even if everyone agrees that something is a problem. So this is a little bit of a tough one um, to understand, sometimes especially if you really believe in the problem and someone else doesn't. So that is pretty much it for the problem. Um, so once, you know, assuming you did everything that Mark said and you checked three times and it is a real problem and everyone agreed on the urgency, it's time to make the proposal. Our, the foundations of a good proposal are pretty simple, right? You have the TLDR, which this is really loud, isn't it? For some of you who, um, if you don't know the acronym, too long didn't read, right? You all know there's like walls and walls and walls of text and Slack and no one has a time or day. So when you put a, uh, a solution, a problem solution statement out in Slack, it's always great to have a TLDR at the very top in one or two sentences to describe what you're actually proposing. And um, contrary to you know, the logical order of things, you wanna write this last, right? You wanna write the problem first, so as you see it, what is the problem that you're actually facing? It's um, you know, try to strip away any facts that aren't actually a problem and saying, this would be great if we could do this, or it would be awesome if users could have a way to do blah, blah, blah. Like those aren't problem statements, those are probably more for the solution. And then of course, once you outline the problem in all its glory and ugliness and whatnot, you write down the solution um, with all the, you know, you wanna be brief, concise, but not too sparse in detail that people can't imagine it. Remember, you're trying to sell them your idea of how to solve this problem, and so you wanna give them enough detail so that they can either agree, disagree, add comments, ask questions, or um, you know, leave no notes and uh, let you move forward. And so with that said, the process to do that is pretty easy, right? You've worked with uh, a group of people to identify this proposal, and you have all these great ideas, you've written something out, and so now it's time to simplify it. Work with a peer, uh, with a small group in private, kind of similar to what Mark said, but at the second iteration of the stage, what this means is that you've actually written something now, down now at this point. And so you might reach out to those same people that you initially reached out to and say, hey, we discussed this problem that we had, and so now I put it on paper based on what we've talked about, I wanna know what you think. And you can go back to the people that you've um, reached out to. You can also reach out to a couple of others who you think might, um, you know, people who you respect, people's advice who um, you want to hear. You might also want to reach out to the person that you think is going to tank that proposal because you'd rather have that conversation with them now than, you know, five days later in Slack in a 200-something thread comment thread. And so 
In that process, what actually ends up happening is that you'll discover advocates. Maybe the person who you thought would tank the idea or might have a lot of great feedback um, and context and whatnot is actually becomes the most person most excited about the proposal that you end up creating. Those advocates can be expensive by employees, they can be your fellow contributors, it could be anyone. And so building that foundation is helpful because it does give you that gut check of like, oh, this is something important, this is something that people think is a valuable way to spend our time. And once you do that, another thing to think about is how does this affect the business, right? It's great when we think about the code or the solution in isolation, but does this mean that we'll get more customers? Does this mean that we'll retain more um, users? Does this mean that we will magically 10x our revenue for without doing anything? Like, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, does it mean that we will have to update some of our policies, right? Internally working with each other, whatnot. And so thinking about the additional context of how it affects other areas of the business also makes your case stronger, especially because you know that these proposals would be reviewed by everyone, not just engineers. Um, this is a process that everyone in the company uses. So providing more um, relevancy to other people and what they're doing as well can help them support your proposal as well. And so once you do all of that, you post it publicly in Slack, which is everyone's nightmare, but if you did all the things, maybe it won't go so bad, right? Like maybe there will be no notes and then you can move forward in the process. That said, like here's a quick visual of like what a proposal looks like. We have the TLDR at the top, we have the problem, we have the solution. And the ways as a non, um, as someone who's, who, you know, is putting it out there, you know, oh, let me rephrase that, turn around. Um, for, the, for everyone else, like you want to make sure that people are engaging and discussing your proposal. And so obviously emojis are a great way to show, to see support. If, people, if you have 20 thumbs up, no comments, no questions, then you're good to go, right? If you have some questions, um, obviously respond to them, engage, provide more context because obviously you are the expert at this point. You've been the one thinking about this for days, weeks, months, years, whatever it is. And so they might just be you know, reacting to the first thing that they're thinking of when they read their proposal. So take the time, to contextualize, uh, uh, respond to the questions. And for you know, the advocates in the room, if you have advocates who helped you craft the proposal, they can jump right in and answer those questions and create that dialogue. Oftentimes what we've seen is that you know, we'll evolve a proposal to something that is better than what it started as because of all the input by the various people who you know, were asking questions and whatnot. And actively summarize as you go along. So if you're in a particularly long thread or a particularly controversial um, or difficult uh, proposal, you know, um, help people like bookmark where you are in the conversation by quickly summarizing like, hey, this is where we're at. Here's the decisions that we've made or the discussions that we had. Do we agree? Send it out to the Slack room and then um, con continue from there. As always, we always push this idea of um, humility, right? The willingness to be wrong. Ideas are just ideas. They don't really define you. If you have a bad idea, it doesn't mean you're a bad or dumb person. It's just an idea. And so the willingness to be wrong and to be okay with maybe the proposal that you put out there wasn't the best solution, that's fine, right? Move along, talk to other people, figure out what the actual best solution is here because we're all in it together. We're all trying to get to a billion users. We're all trying to become, you know, make this the best company that we can. And so it's, um, it's actually like a feature and not a bug of this process. So incorporate those changes, summarize the next steps, and um, then we can move along. <laughs> Mark? Okay, so if you survived the proposal and everyone <laughs> in that thread, let's just assume you got like 100 thumbs up and David Barrett didn't give it a thumbs down, and you're feeling good about it. Um, now we're going to talk about like the just literal next steps of what to do from that point. So, um, yep. Yeah. So you have a proposal. Now what? The first thing you do is create this GitHub tracking issue. So we've got a template that you can use if you're working on a project. Um, you might need to ask someone from Expensify to work to create it for you if you're not internal. But this GitHub tracking issue has like a checklist in it and it goes step by step, breaks down pretty much everything that we're talking about here and some stuff that are not. Um, 
but that's going to be like your guiding issue that you use when you're working on a project with us. So if you have updates on the project, they go into the tracking issue. When you have GitHub issues associated with the project later, they're going to go in this tracking issue. It's like your way of managing this project. So use, use the tracking issue. Next thing is to email strategy at expensify.com to clarify the next steps. You also might need some help in doing this um, if you're working with one of us, a uh, developer, advocate, or whatever on this project, then we'll help you out and do it for you. Um, but that usually contains something like, what am I gonna do next? The proposal went well, here's what we're gonna do, and it's gonna be one of these things or all of these things, some combination of these things. So another Slack meeting, usually, which we call pre-design, which is before you write the design doc, you have one more meeting, um, or maybe more than one, we'll get into that. Um, or you write the design doc, so we've been saying the word design doc a lot, so we should explain what that is. Um, and then implementing the solution. So the pre-design, what is it? It's really similar to the proposal in a lot of ways. The main difference is you're gonna be um, coming back to everyone after doing some research on your own, probably, but not necessarily. You're gonna have questions for people and you're usually gonna have um, some kind of recommendation of a path forward on stuff. So that's kind of the format, how it goes usually. Maybe Jason pioneered it, I'm not sure, but it, it works really well because what we're trying to do with the pre-design is basically just build a consensus and get everyone to agree, which is the hardest thing in the world when you work at a flat company that has a minimal hierarchy. Just getting people to agree on a problem is like amazing. So um, we managed to do it really well. The pre-design helps immensely with this. Um, and one, one of the big things that you can do with it is to explore these controversial ideas. So Joni mentioned before the possibility that your project could get like tanked by something. This is a good point to pull out some of these controversial ideas and make sure that they're getting the proper attention from people if you have to tag people in um, to get their opinions on it. If you think someone would have an opinion on how to do it differently, um, great opportunity to do this. And before you write the design doc, you know, you'll have, that'll basically be your alternate solutions too. So how many pre-designs can I do? It's entirely up to you. I think we've maybe traditionally said, like you kind of should do one at least for, to be like following the process, but I, I've done multiple. So I think you can probably do as many as you need um, during, before, after the design. Dog. And one big benefit of having this pre-design conversation <clears throat> is to basically, it's like a re, it's like writing the design doc before you write the design doc because you're, you're in this conversation, you're getting all these notes. So oftentimes I just take the content of a pre-design and it's like, oh, that's the entire design doc. All I have to do is like copy paste and write it down. And um, yeah, this is just another opportunity to open up the floor for collaboration and get as many ideas involved and as, uh, as diverse of a range of opinion on a subject as you possibly can. Maybe quick note, it seems like a good reason to like maybe do more than just one pre-design. It's like, so yeah. if you do the pre-design, start writing your design up and you're like, oh shit, there's a big hole here. And Absolutely, like, yeah. Back. And like, again, I think it's to your point that there's no surprise. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, don't, if you have an assumption, if you say, I assume you catch yourself saying things like that, just throw it in the Slack room, like ask a quick question, do a small pre-design, whatever it is, just to clarify, because what you assume is might not be what everybody else assumes, right? Like people ha might have more context, more ideas, something else. Um, so, you know, when in doubt, just throw a question out. The best, the worst that can happen is everyone agrees with you and then you feel great. Yeah, and I think also to Jason's point, like, for anyone who's not in Expensify, but even for people who are new inside Expensify, this process can be a little bit confusing. Like I know when I first started, I was like always in the design docs being like, why are we doing stuff this way? Like we should do it some complete other way. And I missed like every conversation that happened before that, like all the way back to the proposal. Like didn't even see the proposal, didn't look at anything. And I'm just like, this is dumb. So. After like, you know, learning more about the process and as time goes on, um, I've recognized better ways. Not to say that that is not allowed. Like your, the design docs are open and you're allowed to do that. So yeah, that's just a, a side. 
All right. Um, so now let's talk about the design doc process, right? You got to a point where you're like, okay, this doc, I need to do it. Makes sense. Going to write down the plan. Half of it's in there. What does it actually look like? And so quick breakdown. Um, you know, we have a template, so there's that. Problem solved, more or less, right? In the template, there's a couple of key things we wanted to point out, um, you know, to highlight and make sure that there's um, some, like, um, eyes on that. But um, so, so the first one is the strategic goal. At the very top of the design doc, you know, um, of course, there's, like, information like, who's running this project? Is there a due date? Like, logistical details like that. Um, but at the very top, there is a section for the strategic goal, which is really a place for you to think, zoom out from the specific problem that you're trying to solve and think, this problem that I'm trying to solve, where does it fit in our pipeline? Where does it fit in the product roadmap? And how is it going to enable us to some bigger idea that's going down the road? Because that context will help make sure that, you know, we're all still going in the same direction our, um, and that we're not doing something that could either derail or maybe make something in the future harder. Um, once you have that, there's the high level section, which, I mean, I'm not gonna stand here and pretend I've memorized this by heart, but there are key sections like you write the problem that you've sent out to everyone, copy and paste it there. There's um, the high level overview of the solution. This is where you can add a little bit more detail, right? And flesh out just a little bit like of um, additional context or ideas that you wanna throw out that you've discussed in the pre-designs. And then we, um, and then once you have that all done, there's other things like economic considerations. Will this cost anything? Will it make anything? Is there legal ramifications? Things like that. And so once you get all of that written down, there's a review process. Um, so obviously you can always ping anybody you want to get it reviewed, whether it's someone you trust, someone who's talked to you about this project, um, maybe someone who you think is going to give you a ton of comments but wasn't in the pre-design, so you want to deal with that first. Um, but you can also use, we have an auto assigner that assigns people from Expensify to review the document. And so the key thing to remember is, I know everyone in this room except for me as an engineer, but like non-engineers also read these docs. And so you want to be straightforward. You want to communicate the idea in the plainest language, like pretend you're explaining it to a child. You know, it's not dumbing it down, it's making it simple. And so there's a lot of um, people involved in that process. And you want to make sure that, actually, I see non-engineers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, so we want to make sure that um, anybody who is interested about this project, anyone who wants to read up, can, and um, it's clear, simple. Yeah, so that kind of leads into the, the detailed section really well, because it's, it's where you put all of the nitty-gritty details of how we're actually going to solve the problem at the end of the day. So it's like the, imagine the fully fleshed out solution. So. The tricky thing with the detailed section, though, is to make sure it has a balanced level of detail because I've seen docs that just have so much detail in them where it just takes you like forever to read it. And so that's not necessarily bad if it needs that much detail. But what you're really going for is more of like a, what are the most important things that we need to know about this project? If we left these things out, it could blow everything up, basically. So what that usually translates to, um, probably for everyone, but just to touch on from an engineering perspective, because um, this is where we're gonna discuss like code changes and everything else. Um, pretty much like file changes, if you're changing a file, if you're changing a method name, like all that stuff would go into it. What wouldn't go into it? The actual code itself. Um, if it needs to be in there, you know, like to get a point across, that's fine. We would prefer that you use pseudocode if you can. Um, if not, then, like I said, it's pretty much okay. Anything with API changes, uh, network stuff, I'm probably forgetting some other things, but basically, like, if you can think of it as being a critical thing, it should go in there. It's not really um, broken up in any other kind of way. It's sort of just, you go for it. The only thing that is a constant, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, is the plan of action at the end, which is more like the step-by-step, -step, what are we gonna do um, broken down <clears throat> as a list. And we do that um, to, so that it will go into GitHub issues right after. Uh, rough tip on the plan of action here um, that someone gave me back in the day was to, your plan of action should be like ordered in the same way that your detailed 
section is. So if you have a paragraph on something, it, you could think of it as like, first we've got to do this, GitHub one, you know, and then you'll end up linking it all together. So if you're delegating to someone else or working on a group project, the design doc will already have in it like a link that goes straight to the section of the design doc where you can review any comments that were left there or get the full context and then understand why you're doing something. Uh, this is another theme at Expensify. Like we ask everyone to just understand why you're doing things. You know, we don't really like assign tasks to people and just say like, this is your job, go do it. Um, we try to be more like, hey, do you know why this is important? And can you like recognize the value that you're creating and really like internalize it and, and feel that? And I feel like, you know, we tend to get a pretty good result going from that direction. And um, yeah, in terms of implementing it, it's a kind of a choose your own adventure. We don't really have any hard and fast rules when it comes to stuff. Um, I personally like to use uh, the GitHub projects stuff to like manage things. If you're like into Kanban or any of these, there are, I don't know, waterfalls, I don't really know about those things. But if that's how you want to do it, go for it. If not, then just get after it. So it's, it's like choose your own adventure. The only constant is going to be update your GitHub tracking issue, like I mentioned before. Yeah, for me, I use paper and pen. That works. Love yeah. notebooks. To-do lists. Um, so, you know, that's it. Super easy, right? I know that we have a couple of uh, FAQs because, you know, there's always one question everyone loves to ask is like, do I have to do a design doc? Do I have to do this? Do I, is it okay to skip it? And my answer here is do whatever you want, but, you know, but, there's always a but, right? Um, the design doc is just a tool for you to organize your thoughts, write out a plan. Everybody is familiar with it. We know how to read it because it's the tool that we use. So when you're in doubt, my advice is always just to write it down, right? Write down the plan so that it's easy to communicate to others. It could be like three pages long. That's okay because once you write it down, execution is the easy part, right? It's the planning, the figuring out, the getting consensus that's difficult. And so, um, there are some times when it is really obvious that you can skip a design doc. Like if you see a typo, it's like, yes, the solution is to fix the typo, right? There's all these problems in between that versus, you know, how do we implement emojis? And so it's up to you, use your best judgment. When you're not sure, ask someone, ask an expensive employee, ask other contributors. Um, but yeah, I think it's kind of, um, it's never, no one ever regrets doing a design doc. People have definitely regretted not writing one. Um, and the second one is, why do we spend so much time talking and emphasizing writing it down? Because if it does, isn't written down, it isn't, doesn't exist, right? You, I can tell you like today that um, you know, the sky is purple, and then you go and tell someone else in the customer facing room that Joni said the sky is purple, and I'm like, no, I didn't. How do you know? I, no one, you know? So like, there's a lot of value in writing things down to ensure that everyone's on the same page and that you're gonna do what you say you do. And that's why we talk so much about write it down, write it down, write down the problem, write down the solution and communicating through writing. Because again, we are in an asynchronous team. We all operate all over the world. And the way that we make sure that people can get involved is by, you know, through written communication. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um... I think, yeah, David kind of touched on that before, like the whole writing it down thing, where, you know, if you're gonna do something that is valuable, taking the time to write it down is just a smart bet, you know? Like it's gonna lead to a more successful product if you've thought about it in like a more, you know, regimented way. Mm -hmm. So, next question, when do we start the coding? I'm sure anyone who asked who ever write a design doc was like, yeah, but uh, can I just like do it? I feel like it's, I'm gonna, it's easy and I wanna start coding now. And the answer to that is, well, you can, but we usually recommend that the optimal time to start coding is after the detailed implementation is done. So that might sound crazy to some of you in the room where you're like, how do I figure out how to do something without actually doing it? Um, and it's true. There are cases where you absolutely need to do like a proof of concept or a prototype like David was talking about. Um, and if that is your situation, you know, it depends. It can be fine. You don't have to be like, 
uh, oh no, it's been told me not to code, I can't do that. No, you can, but in general, you shouldn't. Um, and we say that you shouldn't because there's a high likelihood that you're gonna fall in love with the way that you did it. And there's also a high likelihood that someone might come along and ask you to do it a different way. So, um, in general, it's good to be more open-minded when you approach this process, because we want everyone to be really collaborative and to be willing to have their minds changed in service of this better solution that we're all trying to get towards. So that's pretty much it for one, that one, yeah. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? I think this is the end of our talk now, so we'd love to hear what you've got for us. Oh, oh okay. great. I can. I, the room didn't work for me, so. I'll oh, okay. I can read them. Um, or? Or you want to read your question? Uh, sure. Let's make this interactive. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question was uh, what are some strategies you can employ if people agree on a problem but aren't aligned on the urgency of fixing that problem? Want to take it? Um, good question. Um, so the question was, what are some strategies when you, everyone agrees on the problem, but you don't all agree on the urgency? I would say it's hard to answer that without the context of what is influencing the urgency factor, but I would bring it back to like if you can gather data on something, it's really hard to ignore hard data and numbers. And then I would also say, if you went into that conversation without a source or without uh, the perspective of a real actual person in the world, you might wanna go get that and then come back and it might influence that in some way. Or if you can translate it to like tangible value for the company, I think like dollar signs are probably a good way yeah, to anytime, convince someone that it's more urgent, yeah. Anytime you can tie it to making more money, you got a, you got a good one. Um, but I was also gonna say, um, one thing you can do is, you know, we talked earlier about uh, finding advocates and, and thinking about the business implications and whatnot. And so when you think about um, the urgency, sometimes there are really real business situations, right? Like. I'm, I don't know if you guys are, all know, but like that huge SBB fire, the Silicon Valley Bank fire that just happened last week, like sometimes maybe something you proposed wasn't the right time whenever you proposed it, and then all of a sudden you can figure out a link um, to some event or crisis or thing that is happening now um, that also like speeds up urgency, right? And I think the really, the, the key to that is like contextual clues. What's happening in the world? What's happening in the company? What's happening... Um, here and how can you tie that to your proposal if you can because that will create some urgency and it answers the question why now and why not later. I think another good point to add to that is that we recently added a new section to the proposal template right? strategy to cause the solution. So mm -hmm. talking about the strategy to help uh, solve. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about the strategy. Um, Neil had a question. How do you know if a problem is large enough to be considered a project? Given that we're all busy, how do you know when, the, when is the right time to start a project? So the way I view this is as someone like Mark who has a ton of ideas and I'm like, it would be so cool if we did this or that or um, whatever. Um, one of the things I think about is like, sometimes you, know, you go through the entire process, you have some idea that generally has a lot of, actually this is pretty similar to Rory's question I would say. But I would think the one thing to keep in mind is that just because your idea is not, um, was kind of, you know, not, uh, how do you say it? Like it was turned down at this time, doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad idea, right? It, to me, it's like, you know, when you go to one of those sushi restaurants and there's a conveyor belt and you take a piece of sushi off and you're like, mm, nope, not this one. I'm not really feeling unagi today. So then you can put it back on. And at some point, you know, the unagi will come back around and you're like, okay, now is the time to, to where this makes sense, right? And so I think ideas always have a time and place. Sometimes it's not right now, um, and you just put it back on that sushi wheel or conveyor belt, sorry, um, and um, 
And then when you see the right time and place, when you find the contextual reasons, the business reasons of when this makes sense, that's when you would be able to, um, you know, all of a sudden it's like, it is a project. It is something that we can focus on. Yeah. I'd say there's like also like a, maybe a complexity angle there too. If it's like your project is not super complex and your project is not super controversial and many people just immediately agree with it, you might be like, is it a project at all? I don't know, maybe it's just something I'm gonna do. And that's kind of an option that we have at Expensify oh. too. Yeah. Um, do you wanna take this one? Sure. Ewan, Ewan asks, how long should the process take or rather how long should we expect it to take? Uh, it's like kind of impossible to answer that question in some ways, I think. Um, I don't have the data on that, or nor do I have any conception of time itself. Uh -huh. So I don't know. I would say it, it can be really fast or it can be really slow. It depends on a lot of factors. I think mostly it's if there's something super controversial in your uh, proposal and your doc, it's gonna take longer. Like we're gonna kind of get stuck in the details. Um, it's kind of like on the, the person who's leading the project and writing the doc too, to move these conversations forward at a regular cadence, so um, we didn't really touch on it, but part of being a design doc author is fielding the questions that come in from people. And so people are gonna show up and be like, what's going on with this? And you're gonna have to you know, give them an answer or resolve it. One way that is we recommend to do that is do like the generalizing approach. If you take something that someone has a problem with and generalize the doc, then you can kind of speed up the process. Maybe it's a detail that's not super important. So, I mean, I don't know how long it could take anywhere from months to years to days if it's something that we really want to do and is very urgent. So it's also I, like your personal, you know, are you lazy or, you know, are you consistent about updates? Are you consistent about, um, you know, driving the engagement. Like you can't expect, just because you put something out there, you can't really expect people to just flock and like, you know, and, um, engage because there's just so much going on in the company. There's so many pre-designs, there's so many projects, there's so many features, so many things being put out there. And so sometimes it is on you, the project manager, to ping people on the side one-on-one, -on -one, tag them in the posts, whatever it is to get them engaged and to, you know, make those daily or weekly updates so that people can see that there's movement happening as well. I guess I'd also say like, it's also sometimes not dependent on you. The company prior to the change. Yep. Yeah. In the midst of implementing something and then prior to changes, and like that's kind of outside the control of the Yeah, of for sure. Re referral project. <laughs> Three times. Um, I'm, I'm gonna maybe say her name wrong. Mikkel? Yeah. Michael? Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, any, is there any granulation of problems? Um, what if a problem has, a, has small impact or solution and can be, e wait, what if a problem has small impact or solution can be easily A-B tested? Hmm. Perfect. No, not really. So. I like to think of it as like um, all bugs are problems, not all problems are bugs. So you don't have to fix every single problem, but you have to fix every single bug. So if it's, we do run into cases where a bug will be so severe that it leads back to like this really absurdly nasty root cause that might invoke a, a design doc. But in general, if you're asking about complexity and simple things, no, you can pretty much just fix the bug and move on. Yeah. A-B testing can also be part of your solution if you are not sure, but I think generally we try to focus on one solution because through all the discussion um, and say like, we really think this solution is going to be better than the other. And it's happened before where we didn't pick the right one and then we go back and relook at the solution uh, problem again and we say, actually, let's try the other one. It's happened, no one's died, we're all good, you know. Um, let's see. Alex asked, said, um, I'm not good at design. Can I leverage the design team to help flesh out my idea? When, how can I get the design team involved? So this is a fun one because we have, our design team is one person, but um, 
this is part of the thing that we were talking about in terms of advocates, right? If you can get someone really excited about the idea, if you can prove out the strategic reasons for why you're doing it and the importance of it in the roadmap and whatnot, you, that's how you convince people in general to take part in your project or participate. And design is no different from that. So I think oftentimes, like, you know, we don't want to be asking them to make every single mock-up, every single, you know, whatever. So if you even if you want to attempt it yourself, I'm sure you know we have resources or we can you know invite people to figure. Don't quote me on that, but like you know I'm sure we can figure that out. But I think in the meantime, like there's a lot of ways to create those visualizations. Like I know a lot of people in the room picked up Figma and like just have learned how to do that themselves. Um, so that's something to consider. Yeah, Anything? I mean you can use like we have Whimsical. We use that too, which is like a even more stripped down version of Figma that is basically just wireframes. So. It, it all depends, like, usually design is not going to be, like, the totally critical element mm -hmm. unless it's, like, the ultimate thing that we're doing is, like, a design-based design doc or something like that. So just we're talking about UI, I think you can get away with focusing on the UX more than the UI and we'll, like, get to it when we get to it if it seems like we don't, it's not in, like, the priority list for, like, Sean or whoever he's working with right now. Yeah, and it's not like you don't have to make it pixel perfect. Like I edit in preview actually, and you know my mockups look okay. So as long as you can get the idea across, I don't. I think you can use whatever tool you're comfortable with as well. And Sean will find you and find your PR and show up in the review and be like, change this twenty pixels that way. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Um, next question. How can contributors get more involved with the design doc process? Also, is there a plan to make this process more open and public? Um, well, we are having this session because we want all of you more involved. So I don't know what the order of operations is, but I'm like, you know, we will share the design doc template. I know some people have already started. Um, writing design docs, maybe in this room, maybe not, um, who aren't expensed by employees. And so I think the first first things first is like, you know, start engaging in the process, right? Start um, coming up with the problems and solutions, start writing up the proposals, and it will naturally happen. Um, I think if you're waiting around and you're at, waiting for permission to start it, like that's never going to happen, right? We're not, we're here to solve problems. And because of our lack of hierarchy, no one is specifically watching for you and saying, hey, do you want the design doc template today? So if you do want to get involved, like absolutely, we want everyone to be involved. Um, and that's why we're holding this session. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. I think the, the real answer, you know, um, or the additional answer, sorry, is that we just don't really know at all yet. We're not entirely sure how it would work. I kind of recognize that there's like, this problem of incentive too, where it's like, oh, anyone can do a design doc. Oh, that's cool, but like, how do I get paid? You know, I'm gonna have to like lead this project, do a ton of research. You know, there's a, there are a lot of interesting points that would go into that. Like, um, a lot of times, like you know, we're salaried employees, so we look at this stuff uh, differently. I would say so. Just trying to empathize with someone out there who wants to do that. I would, I'd say like, and if we could figure that out. That would be really cool, and if and more so, we could figure out how to get people to like, I don't know, get compensated for collaborating with us on some of our projects too. That would be cool. I just don't really know how it would work. So, but yeah. that's a problem we could maybe. Explore. Someone make a proposal. Um, last question: How do you track past design docs? Do you have a process for learning from the possibly inaccurate assumptions done in old docs or review them after some time passes? Didn't get it at all. Sorry. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> it just went right, like, right over my. <clears throat> How do you track past design docs? Do you have a process for learning from possibly inaccurate assumptions done in old docs, or review them after some time passes? I feel like we don't really have a process for that well, per we, se, or maybe we do. Well, I was gonna say so. <laughs> at the very end of the doc, there is a project wrap up summary, and so what we do is we talk about what went well, what could have gone better what were the conclusions and what would you have changed, right, like moving forward. And so that's um, part of the process in, for us in terms of like figuring all that stuff out. And sometimes, you know, that does come out right after 
but we, um, that's one tool that we use. We don't actively go back and reread docs and think like, oh, what could we have done differently and whatnot because the product changes so quickly, the roadmap changes so quickly, our priorities um, update. And sometimes when you start a design doc, the where you end up and how you've changed it over the course of the project is completely different, right? And so there are, um, we use tools like that. We use um, postmortems to kind of reflect on like what went well and what didn't went, go well. And yeah, if we didn't do a good job, which is unlikely because we did a design doc and we're all smart, so we should do it right every time. But yeah, it happens. And I think it's pretty easy to just trace it back. Like if you are find yourself in a situation where you're like, wow, this sucks, who did this? You can probably find the doc and be like, it was me, I did it, yeah. So um, that's, there's not a formal process for it, but yeah. Um, that's the end of the question list. Um, yes. Yeah, so the question, just to repeat it for the room, is how um, sometimes you can't, uh, uh, like there's no specific monetary value tied to the thing that you're trying to do, so how do you determine value and how do you, um, yeah. I would say it's, a, it's one of the hardest things to do, like to take your idea and work it back into a, a concrete problem. It can be extremely challenging, but um, learning more about the problem area, like I mentioned before, can help you like, think of what kinds of problems might be associated with it. Um, I don't know, it, it really depends on what it is, but it's, it's just, it can be super tricky or even, I don't know, sometimes impossible. And it might be a sign that you shouldn't be using TypeScript, but I would invite someone to say like, hey, there's a good reason for it. You know, you kind of have to like get creative with it, with your problems, but we've definitely, you know, we're, we're open to ideas and Changes, we just like believe that the most valuable ideas are, you know, expressed in terms of their I, I value would, too. Yeah, and I would say like you're you know, we're we're a group of people and so never feel um, afraid to like approach and ask someone, whether it's in a group or someone in a DM, because I think sometimes all of us we get in this hyper focused mode and we're just looking at the thing that we're looking at. And so sometimes it helps to like ask someone else in the room and just to take that step back and say, like, hey. You know, when I started this project two months ago, it was really valuable, important. I've noticed some things in the business shift. Is it okay? Or, or do we still think this is as valuable as it was when we started? And so sometimes taking that step back proactively or sometimes you see something else, like you see another project where that makes sense and you say, hey, you know, I don't want to stop the progress or like anything here, but I just want to gut check. Like I just found out this information that changes my perception of the value of this project. So I wanted to stop and like chat about it before you continue and, and so forth. So I think for us, if we can all kind of do that together and when you see something like that and you're like, hey, maybe this isn't the best use of their time, like that's a great service in my opinion to that person because like I would also want someone to tell me if you know whatever I was working on all of a sudden um, wasn't the most important thing out there. Yeah, which doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Like you might still go after it if it's what you're passionate about. Yeah, I would add one last thing, which is you don't have to ask anyone permission to do anything. Like, go ahead and do it. And the only thing that we expect is if it goes horribly wrong, that you stick around to like help clean up the mess. Yeah. And just take responsibility for it. One more I would say it depends on like the, the complexity. Again, it would be like, if what you're proposing is gonna pull an entire engineering team's attention away from something so that they can no longer work on roadmap issues, then you would probably piss off David in marketing. But 
otherwise, if it's not super complex, I would highly doubt that anyone from the marketing team would care well, about your developer experience improvement, but it's possible. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you know, to, to what Tim said, you can, you can do it, but you can't, like, if you haven't convinced me that it's valuable on the marketing side, I'm not going to do it, right? So I think there's a bit of that where you can't just expect just um, that the resource is there because you, this is both the, the beauty and the, one of the difficulties of working in a flat organization is you have to prove the value that this is worth someone's time, right? It's very easy for yourself because you're like, I want to work on this. I think it's important. But now you have to go out and say like, hey, Joni, like, you know, I want to do this. I think it's great for marketing. Um, and I'll say, you know, I don't know, right? Like, but I think mostly what will happen is that we'll at least try to talk through like, why, why do you think it's important? And um, come to some kind of agreement or conclusion. Um, Cause we try not to, what is that phrase that David hates? We try not to like um, agree to disagree, right? We try to like reach a conclusion like, okay, this is what we want to move forward. So if, you know, if everyone signs off and the majority of the company says, this is the thing we want to do, then I think agree to disagree means, okay, now that I've said my piece and we all agree, like now I'm going to move forward and help you with this project or whatnot. Yeah. Yep. Great. I'm going to cut everyone off because it's lunchtime. Cool. So right. thank you so much, Mark and Joni. Thank you, everyone.